So welcome to the fourth presentation of CROC2 2020 booklet, the fourth presentation. All right, so let us begin right away. So on the third day after the artificial abortion, the woman was hospitalized into the gynecological department in a severe condition with signs of intoxication. So this intoxication occurred after an artificial abortion. There was abdominal pain and there was a prolonged discharge from the vagina. Objectively, the patient's condition is severe. Her body temperature is 38.8, her pulse is 100 per minute, blood pressure is 11070. The uterus is soft, the fundus is located at the level of the navel. There are signs, positive signs of peritoneal irritation. So we've talked about peritoneal irritation, a positive sign representing a sign of peritonitis. This means that there is what peritonitis. So what is the most likely diagnosis in this question? So now with the history of an artificial abortion, the pervis could have been infected by some microorganisms. And of course, like I said earlier on, a positive sign of peritoneal irritation simply means that there is an inflammation of the peritoneum of the pervis and hence pelvic peritonitis, pelvic peritonitis. So that is what we could be looking at in this question. So over here, our best answer should be pelvic peritonitis. So C is our answer. Now you witness a car accident. When examining the place of the accident, you noticed a man of about 30 years who was hit by the car. He is unconscious on his head. On his head, on the left, there is a profuse hemorrhage with a bright red blood. How to stop this hemorrhage? Now, for whatever it is, there is definitely what? A bleeding or an artery has been tempered with. An artery has been tempered with. So over here, you could be uh, looking at Maybe the carotid artery or the, yeah, maybe the carotid artery because it's around, around the head area and this bleeding is bright red. And we know the, the blood supply to the brain or to the head basically comes from the carotid arteries. So that place could have been tampered with or the bleeding could originate from that place. And that's why over here, we need to do a digital occlusion, decatal occlusion. Just put your hands tight at that area. Put your hand tight at that area. And that, that pressure could reduce the, how do you call it? The bleeding from, from continuing. And that's why over here, we will be looking at what a decatal occlusion with what we call the mukulish method the Mukulish method. So decatal occlusion should be our answer. So your answer here is A. A 27-year-old man complains of pain in his legs, prolonged discharge from the eyes, painful burning sensation during urination. This disease onset was acute. He, was, he has a history of influenza. So now we are having joint pains isn't it? We are having problem with the eyes. We are having problem with urination. All because of a history of influenza. I mean, he has a history of influenza. Now, the patient's condition and drinks, the patient smokes and drinks alcohol in excess. In his line of work, he is often away on a business trip. What is the likely etiological factor of this disease? What is the likely disease? So first of all, what is the condition that we are looking here? So I've told you guys that anytime we have uh, a rheumatology question, which is accompanied with urethritis or cervicitis, you are looking at a problem called reactive arthritis. 
reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis. So problem with the eyes, problem with uh, joint, problem with the urinary system. You are definitely looking at reactive arthritis. Reactive arthritis. And when it comes to the urinary system, one of the agents that can lead to this sort of infection is the chlamydia. Is the chlamydia trachomatis. Of course, Shigella and Salmonellosa are also other uh, things that can cause, but those ones are from intestinal origin. Those are from intestinal origin. But for sexual origin or for the, from sexually transmitted infections, you are definitely looking at for what? Chlamydia. Chlamydia. And that's why over here, you are looking at B as your possible answer. B as your answer. A 57-year-old man who is a minor complains of pain in his chest, dyspnea on physical exertion, excessive sweating, constant subfibril temperature, and a cough that produces blood-stricken sputum. Blood-stricken sputum. He has been smoking, guys, smoking for approximately 40 good years. So whatever it is, definitely you are looking at a chronic problem related to what? To smoking. And even without going through the questions, you could be looking at a problem with a cancer. Yes, problem with a cancer. People who smoke or who are chronic smokers, eventually they end up developing a, 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 a cancer in the lungs. So don't neglect that as a possible differential. But we, we can continue to read about it. Now, he takes two packs a day. You can imagine. So two packs a day multiplied by 40 good years. This is serious. And look at it. No wonder he frequently has pneumonias. Survey chest x-ray shows a triangular shadow, guys, in the middle lobe of the right lung. A triangular shadow. Now, one of the epices of the shadow points to the lung root, to the lung root. So this could be a peripheral lung cancer. It could be a peripheral lung cancer. The cardiac and mediastinal shadows are displaced towards the affected area. Make your provisional uh, diagnosis. Make your provisional diagnosis. So, so this could be a sent... Uh, a central lung cancer, not a periphery. Central rather. Yeah, I think it should be central rather, not, not peripheral. Yeah. Good. So over here, what are you looking at? We are definitely looking at what, a, can a cancer. Definitely we are looking at a cancer. With this history of smoking, we are looking at a cancer. And of course, the shadow, x-ray showing the shadow, the triangular shadow in the middle loop of the right lung. Middle loop of the right lung lung, middle loop of the red lung. All right. So cancer of the lungs, of course, the right side would be more appropriate in this question. Now, a district doctor has diagnosed one of his patients with this century. Again, another name for this, uh, this century is what? Is shigellosis. Shigellosis. And shigellosis is a, is a very acute condition that will make you run like crazy. Excuse me for my words. So because of that, it can easily lead to dehydration. It can easily lead to dehydration. And so therefore, we have to report this thing urgently. 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 To prevent any case of dehydration. So over here, what accounting document reflects the type of morbidity? So this is an urgent case. So Always, we have to give out an urgent report. So E will be the most appropriate here. A 31-year-old drug-addicted person complains of cough with their blood expectorations. There is dyspnea, there is persistent fever, and leg edemas. Leg edemas. The jugular veins are distended. Jugular veins distended. There is dispersion detected above the base of the cephoid process and in the second intercostal space on the left, close to the edge of the sternum. Close to the edge of the sternum. Heart sounds are clear. Arrhythmia is detected. Heart rate is 128 per minute pause. Blood pressure is this. What is 
the most likely diagnosis what is the most likely diagnosis now look at it over here look at the jugular vein they said the jugular vein veins are distended it means that these uh, veins are sort of enlarged they are sort of inflamed why because one way or the other blood is not or, or, or blood is just coming back one way or the other blood is just coming back so this has to do with a problem with the heart a problem with the heart that is what comes to mind a problem with the heart and if there's a problem with the heart over here we will be definitely be looking at infective endocarditis infective endocarditis which is just an infection of the inner surface of the heart usually it concerns with the valves it concerns with the valves and risk factors include valvular heart diseases rheumatic disease congenital heart diseases artificial valves hemodialysis intravenous drug use and electronic pacemakers so these are the risk factors for infective endocarditis so looking at the fact that we are having a jugular vein distension accompanied or which came as a result or which is accompanied with a history of drug addiction drug addiction would definitely predispose this person to a problem with infective endocarditis and that is why over here our answer will be a our answer will be a and of course the edema formation is also because of the heart is not able to take in all the blood and you know push it to where they are supposed to go to and so therefore they are regurgitating backwards or they are not moving they are stagnant and so therefore they begins to accumulate in the lower limbs they begin to pass, i mean accumulate in the jugular vein that's why they are distended and then the leg is also what edematous so again over here we are looking at what infective endocarditis why because of the problem with the jugular veins the edemas and of course with the history of drug addiction all right so here your answer will be a a seven year old boy after a fall from a height presents with a rapid and a shallow breathing and a cyanotic face so the person fell from a height now there's a shallow breathing and a cyanotic face that means uh, oxygen one way or the other is not moving throughout the system or perfusion is impaired now the right half of his thorax is distended the right is distended and uh and takes no part in respiration again anytime there is an injury to the chest or there is an rta that's road traffic accident so this could also be a form of road traffic accident even though not entirely road traffic accident but definitely there is what an injury to the chest or to the chest wall and one of the things that we have established is the probability or a risk factor or rta or falling from this kind of height is a risk factor for developing what we call a, a, a pneumothorax developing what we call what a pneumothorax so again looking at the fact that the person that part of the heart cannot take part in respiration you could be thinking of something like that that means that the lung is collapsing pneumothorax simply means that the lung is collapsing literally it means lung is collapsing now percussion detects tamponitis in the affected area with while auscultation detects no breathing there what pathology is the most likely cause of clinical presentation what instrumental examination would be most informative in this case again we said if in any time now we know that it's a problem with the lungs and so therefore we are definitely looking at what a tension pneumothorax or we're looking at a pneumothorax and we've established that one of the instruments that we use to analyze the uh, the lungs is what of course an x-ray an x-ray if it is the if it is the heart you are thinking of what an echo or you are thinking of what 
uh, an ECG, isn't it? But with the lungs, you are or you should be concerned with an X-ray, an X-ray. All right. So here, your answer would be A. A 55-year-old woman came to a gynecologist with complaints of leukorrhea or leukorrhea and a bloody discharge from the vagina after five years of menopause. So whatever it is that we are having over here is occurring after menopause, after menopause, five years of menopause. So after menopause. So this is a postmenopausal what bleeding, a postmenopausal bleeding. So again, you need to look at the differentials for postmenopausal what uh, bleeding. And by now, you should know it because we have treated them in our ops and gynae uh, basis. So by now, you should be good at these things. You should know them. So know your differentials, and and of course. Looking at the question, you can now tell which is the exact diagnosis, isn't it? Because the analysis will point you towards the exact, uh, how do you call it, diagnosis. Good. So now let's continue. Now, analysis states no pregnancy. By manual, on bimanual examination, the uterus and the uterine appendages are without changes. They are without changes. During diagnostic coverage of the uterine cavity, the physician scraped off, guys, look at it. The physician scraped off a sample of en encephaloid matter. Encephaloid matter. What is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? These are more or less like scraping from the womb. These are more like scrapings from the womb or the endometrial lining. Endometrial lining. And don't forget, we said we can use DNC to diagnose a postmenopausal bleedings. Yes, we talked about them. We talked about them. So don't get confused what they are using DNC or the diagnostic heritage to do that or to diagnose this person. So there was a scraping of this matter. And because of that, we are looking at this as an endometrial cancer or carcinoma. Endometrial carcinoma. Endometrial carcinoma. These matters are sort of an abnormal growth of cells. Abnormal growth of cells in the endometrial lining. And you know the endometrium is found also in the womb, isn't it? So that is why over here, we are looking at endometrial carcinoma, endometrial carcinoma. And it's even the most common after menopause. Endometrial carcinoma is the most common after menopause. In the case of cervical carcinoma, there could be mentioned things like a, a cauliflower appearance, whatever, whatever it be, and everything will be pointing towards it. And you will know that this is this or this is that. But over here, our attention is on the cavity. It's inside the uterus. So here, we are looking at the endometrial carcinoma. All right. What modern organizational method can provide the patient in the remote settlement with a timely access to quality medical aid and such medical services are consulting, diagnostic, and treatment, especially in the situations when time and distance are crucial. So this question is even, it's like they foresaw things happening in 20, I mean, in this season or this year, let me just say last year. Good. So this coronavirus season or year that has just passed or that we are still in, you wear that. People don't meet one-on-one -on -one again. Now, social distances have become a thing. Social distancing. So now people use the Zoom to talk to people, to have their conversations, to have their meetings. Even in the field of medicine, we can use Zoom to do that. And that method of, uh, of, of, of uh, rendering, uh, how do you call it, services or medical services to people in the remote areas, we term it as a tele 
medicine. Tele medicine. Tele medicine. All right. So basically, that is what it is. So the zooms, the go to meetings, the name them. All these. Uh, let me say, platform that we use to communicate with people, we can use them in medicine. These are all what method of what, what you call telemedicine. So this is actually the area whereby we are now using this telemedicine, telemedicine. So over here, our answer will be what? D. A 17-year-old girl has been suffering from hepatic cirrhosis for three good years now hepatic cirrhosis that is scarring of the liver this person has been suffering from this condition for three good years lately her periods of ex excitation have been intermittent with depression she does not sleep enough objectively her condition is severe the girl is sluggish give one word responses tremor of the extremity her skin is ecteric single hemorrhagic rashes name the likely complication of her disease guys you can definitely know that these or uh, for example the one word responses the tremors these are all cns manifestations these are all brain manifestations or c uh, the central nervous system manifestations so therefore anytime we are having a disease with a CNS manifestation, like for example, the liver cirrhosis with a CNS manifesta manifestation, the term we use to describe that is called what? Hepatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy simply means a problem with the central nervous system or a disease of the central nervous system or simply put a disease of the brain. Exactly. So over here, we are looking at a hepatic encephalopathy. Party, hepatic encephalopathy. That means the presence of CNS manifestation in the middle or as a result of a problem with the liver. All right. And of course, in this kind of cases, what substance can affect the brain the most? And I believe you'll be thinking of what? Uh, ammonia, isn't it? Ammonia can uh, disrupt the brain like crazy. All right. That's just by the way. Now, a man works in casting of non-ferrous metals, non-ferrous metals and alloys for 12 good years. Alloys for 12 good years. So these are dealing with metals, isn't it? Now, in the air of working area, there was registered high content of heavy metals. So again, they've told you about heavy metals, carbon monoxide and nitrogen. During periodic health examination, the patient present as the no vegetative what syndrome sharp abdominal pains constipation pain in the hepatic area now in the urine we have what aminolavulinic acid and copro copropophorin <laughs> are detected now in the blood we have what reticulocytosis low hemoglobin levels such intoxication is caused by what? So now the clue here is the appearances of the urine, what we were able to detect in urine. And that is the what? The aminolavulinic acid and in the copper uh, porphyrins. These things are very, very, very concerned with lead poisoning. Lead poisoning. Lead. Now there are a lot of metals here, so you could easily be confused. But the clue here is the urine findings, the urine findings, the urine findings. And over here, we are looking out for what? For lead poisoning, lead poisoning, lead poisoning. That's over here. Our answer will be lead and lead salt. Lead salt, salt. So D would definitely be our answer. And there's something that, it is not here, but let me just chip it in for you guys, just in case, I mean, for the sake of a practice. Now, if you want to diagnose lead poisoning, you must check what we call the blood film. And the blood film will reveal what we call a basophilic stippling. Basophilic stippling. Basophilic stippling of the red blood cells. These are just dots 
in the red blood cells visible through a microscope. Dot inside the red blood cells, they are called what? A basophilic stippling. So in diagnosis, you have to see this. You have to see this. And of course, it's also accompanied with iron deficiency anemia. It's also accompanied with iron deficiency anemia. And that's why hemoglobin level will definitely will also be sort of low. All right. So that is just by the way. So here your answer is D. During regular examination of a two-year-old boy, he presented with an enlarged left kidney, painless on palpation. The right was undetectable. So now we are palpating the, kid the kidneys. Right we can find, left we cannot find. Now excretory urography shows no contrast on the right. No contrast on the right. That means we cannot see anything there. We can't see anything there. Don't forget, urography, urography is used to test to test for any sort of thing in uh, from from the pelvis to the ureter into the I mean to the bladder. All that area, we use the urinary what bladder. Sorry, uh, we use the excretory urography to help us to identify something like that. Good. So now we can't find anything. Now, cystoscopy detected hemiatrophy of the urinary bladder. Hemiatrophy of the urinary bladder trigone. The right urethral orifice, the right urethral orifice is not detected. So the opening of the ureter to the bladder is not detected. So what are you thinking about? Definitely there's a problem with the right kidney. And that means that that part is not developed. It's underdeveloped or it's not even there. Underdeveloped or it is not even there. And so therefore over here, we can call this condition as a genesis or renal agenesis. Renal agenesis of the right uh, kidney or a genesis of the right side. Good. So over here, we will be dealing with what? A genesis. And of course, a genesis could be unilateral or bilateral. When we say unilateral, that means one side. So over here, this would be what? A, unila uh, a unilateral renal agenesis. But if it would be both, we'll have called it what? A bilateral. 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 So over here, the kidneys or that part of the kidney has failed to develop. It has failed to develop to develop. All right. So over here, your answer is B. Now, a 34-year-old woman, after rapidly changing her position from horizontal to vertical, suddenly, suddenly, peeled. what is that? Was suddenly peeled and fell down. Her skin became moist. Her limbs are cold. Her pulses her pupils are dilated. The pulse is rapid and thready. Blood pressure is 50, 25. What condition has likely developed in this patient? So now, patient is in the horizontal position. So more or less like you are lying down. Okay, you are lying down. And suddenly, you stand on your feet. That's what being vertical. So they are saying that when the woman rapidly change her position from sleeping, that is horizontal, to standing, the person what got peeled, fell down, and the skin became moist, and her limbs got cold, and the pupils were dilated. Even pause was 50, 25. So what is it? Definitely, we, this is not shock, but rather what, a collapse. Rather a collapse. Now, it's just a matter of time, everything will come back to what, to normal. Now, when you, how do I even put it? When you stand suddenly, from lying down position, you stand up suddenly, all the blood can move to your lower extremities. So that means that your brain, or your upper part of the body will be devoid of enough blood supply or enough perfusion. And when starting happens, the only way that the brain can respond to that is to have what you call 
uh, you have lightheadedness. That's more or less like what feeling dizzy and feeling you know it, you just collapse. But uh, like I said, just a matter of time, everything will just come back to normal. And usually, uh, there will be a reflex called the reflex vasoconstrictor. Vessel constrictor. So the vessel now constrict to push blood to the appropriate places, including especially the brain, especially the brain, especially the brain. So everything will come back to normal. Everything will come back to normal. All right. So over here, our answer board will be collapse. I think I've seen this question in Croc one as well. All right. Good. So we have on a laboratory investigation of a pork sample, there is one dead trachinella detected in 24 sections. The meat should be, guys, one bad egg will just affect the whole egg. I mean, the whole, yeah, the whole, whatever, whatever, whatever. So definitely we have to dispose it we have to dispose it. We have to dispose. So this will be sent for technical disposal. It should be sent for technical disposal because one rotten uh, trigenella, I mean, one trigenella can affect the rest of the meat or the rest of the pork. All right. So over here, it should be sent for technical disposal. All right. Employees work in conditions of high dust concentration, high dust, certain chemicals, silicon dioxide content and the physical properties of the dust aerosol contribute to the development of occupational dust induced diseases. So of course, this can be termed as what? Pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis. So it will end up affecting the lungs because when you start breathing in all of these dust and all of these uh, uh, carbon dioxide, I mean, silicon dioxide stuff, eventually they will all start entering into your, your lungs. But the question is not about that. The question is, what is the main physical property of dust aerosol? Of course, it is in the air, isn't it? It is in the air. And this, or they are suspended in the air. And this is called what? Dispersion. 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 So your answer here is what is C. Dispersion. It has got nothing to do with it to do with magnetization or electric charges, whatever, it is just dispersion. That means suspended particles, in, suspended particles in the air. Yeah, or particles in the air, suspended particles in the air. I think it's the same thing. All right. Now, a woman complains of a severe pain in her throat on the left, difficult swallowing and a mouth opening, elevated temperature, general malaise, the onset of the disease was four days ago after a case of tonsillitis. So again, they've given you a clue of what your answer should be. So they've told you there's a history of what tonsillitis. Now, examination detects trismus of the mastic, uh, mastigatory muscles. The left tonsil is displaced towards the midline. The anterior lateral arc is infiltrated and protruding. The original lymph nodes on the right are enlarged and painful on palpation. Painful on palpation. Make the diagnosis. Make the diagnosis. So actually, this is a condition called Quincy. Quincy. Q-U-I-N-S-Y. Quincy. So Quincy. Yeah, going to be Quincy. So Quincy is just uh, the production of what of a pass due to an infection behind the tonsil, an infection behind the tonsil. So that is what this is. And of course, another name for the Quincy is the peritonsillar abscess. This is not a lacuna. No, this is not a lacuna ton uh, tonsillar. This is a peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar abscess. Peri tonsillar abscess. So please take note of that. Or oh, another name for it is called the Quincy. The Quincy. The Quincy. The Quincy. All right. And one of the complications of this is the blockage of the airway. It can block the airway or it can lead to 
aspiration pneumonitis aspiration pneumonitis aspiration pneumonitis and again the pain is always on one side or it's on the affected side the pain will be on the affected side all right so again our answer here will be what uh, peritonsillar abscess or quincy so b will be our answer During winter, epidemics of influenza caused predominantly by virus, virus. <laughs> so this is the, <laughs> the nature of the virus. Don't tell me to pronounce these things because me, I don't even know what they are talking about over here. But then that is the, the virus. On the second day after the disease onset, a 30 year old Hospitalized man presented with high fever, dry cough, myalgia, headaches, and general weakness. What should be prescribed as an etiotropic treatment in this case? So again, they've told you that there was what epidemic of what of influenza virus, influenza virus, and these influenza viruses they contain some uh, let me say enzymes, some enzymes. These enzymes are called uh, Neuraminidase. 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 So, of course, so if you want to treat these uh, viruses, what you have to do is to inhibit that enzyme. Is to inhibit that enzyme called neuraminidase. Neuraminidase. Inhibit that enzyme. And that's what over here, it will be what? Neuraminidase inhibitors inhibitors and uh, I, I think in ukraine some, a lot of you like using this uh, this drug called uh, tamiflu when you're having cold and stuff like that you use your tamiflu yes so tamiflu is <laughs> it's an example of what uh neuraminidase inhibitor yes it's an example of it sometimes so if you are using it in the early you know the drug but you don't know that that is the function of that drug so usually when you're having fever coughing and then headaches Sometimes running nose and things like that, you're going to use that drug. And it's very, very, very good. Very effective. Very, very effective. After drinking it, trust me, you'll feel very hot. I mean, you'll be sweating. Not hot, but you'll be sweating. You'll be sweating. All right. So over here, we are looking at what? Neuraminidase inhibitors. Neuraminidase inhibitors. All right. A 30-year-old woman complains of itching skin predominantly in the evening and at night. In the evening and at night. The condition lasts for two weeks already. On the second of, on the skin of the interdictal folds, mammary glands, abdomen, buttocks, and thighs, there are numerous fine papilla and papillovesicular rashes located in pairs, guys located in pairs and it become more severe in the evening and at night dr kajessica gogo will tell me skibis skibis so definitely you're looking at what at skibis skibis so this one don't even argue simply put your answer is what skibis 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 all right so what how do you treat skibis but now you should know it I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. We've discussed this in our presentation already. So please do well to watch them. Do well to watch them. All right. But over here, your answer is C. Is C. Is C. So let me know what tropical drug can we use for scabies or what should we use? What's the treatment? All right. A 20-year-old patient complains of a severe headache, double vision, weakness, fever, irritability, blah, blah, blah. Temperature is 38.1. Patient is reluctant to contact, sensitive to stimuli. There is ptosis of the left eye, eyelid, exotropia, anisocoria, pronounced meningeal syndrome, on the guys, 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 guys. See, just move straight and then think about it critically. So now there's a pronounced meningitis syndrome 
end on the uh, cerebrospinal fluid, what do we see? There's a pressure of a 300. The fluid is clear, slightly uh, opalescent. 24 hours later, there appear a fibrin uh, film. There appear a fibrin with film. Uh, protein is this, leukocyte, sorry, lymphocyte, glucose. What is the provisional diagnosis? What is the provisional diagnosis? So the presence of these, uh, how do you call it? So now the question is, definitely we know that it is what meningitis, but what type of meningitis are we looking out for? What type of meningitis will we be looking out for? And of course, you know, uh, how do I call it? Don't forget that in, 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 in tuberculosis meningitis, sometimes they'll let you know it in the question with an, with an analysis, or they will let you know using, uh, how do you call it? The presence of lymphocyte. The presence of lymphocyte. So please take note of that. They'll let you know the let you know in respect to what the presence of, of lymphocyte or in the presence of what of a history of a tuberculosis. That is how it helps, or, or, or that's the way that we it helps us to diagnose this sort of what condition. So over here, we are definitely looking at what at a tuberculosis meningitis, tuberculosis meningitis tuberculosis meningitis so over here your answer is a please a please a a a, a. don't go into because of the uh, there is lymphocyte there so you are going for lymphocytic meningitis to be honest with you i don't even know what i don't even i don't know how common this disease is but of course it's something you could be looking at too i mean looking at for but it is not a common a disease for us to be looking at it. I mean, it's not been well under uh, uh, steady for us to know more about it. But then, like I said earlier on, over here, we would definitely go in for tuberculosis meningitis. Tuberculosis meningitis. All right. All right. And again, to, in tuberculosis meningitis, too, there is a, how do you call it, Jeff? There's elevated protein and the low glucose. Elevated protein, low glucose. Elevated protein, low glucose. Please put this at the back of your mind as well. All right. So answer is A. So three hours after a trauma, a young man developed bradycardia. Bradycardia of 46 per minute. Anisocoria, anisocoria, hemihyperreflexia, hemihyperstasia on the left, a convulsive disorder. The character of this process needs to be clarified. What method of examination will be accurate? Will be accurate. So the question that what problem is it? Look at it after a trauma. All of these things, all of these are all CNS manifestations. So if the CNS manifestation, it has to do with the problem with the brain. So what do you do? You definitely do what a CT scan, head CT to be specific. You do a head CT, head CT. It will show you all the, uh, 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 the sinuses, the ventricles, everything. It will show it to you. So over here, we're considering what a head CT. Head CT. A 75-year-old man in a severe condition suffers from dyspnea at rest. Dyspnea at rest. Marked weakness and arrhythmia. Look at it. Abdominal aortic pulsation is observed. Is observed. Further on... Further on, there is a systolic mama detected. There's a systolic mama detected. Palpation revealed a volumetric formation in the mesogastrium. Blood pressure is 70-40. No pulsation over the femoral arteries. No pulsation over the femoral 
artery, oligorrhea is detected. Which diagnosis is the correct one? Which diagnosis is the correct one? So again, the clue here, or the clues here, are the abdominal uh, aortic pulsation, and of course, the fact that uh, there is a volumetric formation in the mesogastrum, and even the absence of pulsation in the femoral nerve, or so in the femoral artery, all gives you an indication that we could be having what aneurysm. You could be having what you call aneurysm. And this is what? Dissecting aortic aneurysm. Dissecting aortic aneurysm. So over here, your answer will be D. Our answer will be what? D. Our answer will be D. Dissecting aortic aneurysm. All right. A dweller of the northern Dnieper area, a fisherman for the last several days, had been complaining of a discomfort in his right subcoastal area. Periodical episodes of diarrhea intermittent with constipation, frequent skin rashes, abdominal ultrasound shows an enlarged liver and a pancreatic head make the provisional diagnosis make the provisional diagnosis and over here we are looking at opistochiasis 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 and this is uh, uh how do you call it uh it's usually associated with hepatobiliary damage this opistochiasis is usually associated with hepatobiliary damage and even inflammation and, and then and periductal fibrosis. Fibrosis. Basically, so that is what we'll be what we'll be uh, definitely be looking at for. And looking at the history of the fisherman coming from the Nepa area or Nyapa area, we will still stand by our decision to make this opistochiasis, opistochiasis. So here, your answer will be what? Will be D. Your answer will be D. Again, this has, a, uh, it has been associating itself with hepatobiliary damage, hepatobiliary damage. And that is why ultrasound can make up the liver and the pancreatic head for us. All right, so here, D will be our answer. A 25-year-old woman was brought into the gynecological department with a profuse bloody discharge from her genital tracts. So she's bleeding, 25 years. She is 12 weeks pregnant. So what comes to your mind? You are not supposed to be bleeding when you are pregnant. So when such things happen, you should, be start, you should start considering a case of a spontaneous abortion. But of course, we've discussed it. We've discussed the different types of spontaneous abortion, isn't it? We have. If you can't remember it, please do well to review the videos on Ops and Gynae base. So the pregnancy is planned. Okay. So that means she actually wants the pregnancy because the pregnancy is planned. So she wants the pregnancy. Now, within the last three days, she was experiencing pains in her lower abdomen that eventually started resembling resembling cramps. She developed bleeding. Her skin is pale, pulse is 88, blood pressure. Uh, yeah, temperature. Examination, the uterus size corresponds with 11 weeks of pregnancy. Cervical canal allows, guys, look, it allows insertion of one finger and contains fragments. Oh, Lord. Fragment of the fertilized ovum. The discharge is profuse and is bloody and profuse. What is the likely diagnosis? Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, abortion has already was taking place. Abortion has already taken place and there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to help her to scoop everything out of her. So over here, we are having what? A spontaneous abortion in progress 
spontaneous abortion in progress because you cannot see fertilized ovum, fragment of the fertilized ovum, and then the canal is also what opened. All right. A 39 year old man, <clears throat> a battery attendant, a battery attendant, you already know what it is metal, battery, they deal with what? Lead. They deal with lead. They deal with lead. Suddenly develop weakness, loss of appetite, non localized, colloquy, abdominal pains, nausea, skin is gray, uh, pink gray stripes on the gums, stomach is soft, sharply painful. Blood test, guys, look at it, look at it, look at this, look at it, look at it, look at it. Blood test detected electrocyte with basophilic stippling and anemia. We remember when we talked about the lead and then the lead, talk about the lead poisoning to be specific. We said to diagnose it, we will see what a basophilic stippling. These are just like a holes inside the RBCs or the red blood cells. And of course, the person will develop an iron deficiency anemia, anion deficiency anemia. Now the patient has a history of peptic ulcer. Constipation tends to occur every three to four days. But so definitely you are looking at what? At lead poisoning. Lead poisoning. An 18 year old patient complains of skin rash. The patient has been suffering from this condition for five years. So skin rash for five years. The first instance of this disease occurred after a car accident. Objectively, the patient presents with a popular rash covered with a sl silvery scales. Silvery scales. Dimple, sign, small pit. That small pit on the nails. Okay. Affected joints. What is the most likely diagnosis? Over here, your clue here is with the popular rash that is covered with this, uh, silvery scales. This is very, very uh, diagnostic for what we call psoriasis. Very diagnosis for psoriasis, where the skin tends to multiply faster or more than 10 times the normal rate. More than 10 times the normal rate. And uh, like I said, one of the key features is the presence of this silvery scales, silvery scales, or a silvery color, silvery one, color. And this is even become more pronounced when you try to scrape them off. When you try to scrape it off, it become more pronounced, more pronounced. And if you want to diagnose psoriasis, we use a test called the Grattage test, G-R-A-T-T-A-G-E, Grattage. Gratitude test, gratitude test, or by taking a skin biopsy. So you can take a skin biopsy or you can do the gratitude test, the gratitude test. So here we are looking at what? At a psoriasis, psoriasis, psoriasis. All right. During regular examination, a Lucium student presents with the signs of Chelitis that manifests as epithelial maceration in the area of the lip seal. The lips are bright red with a single vertical crux covered with brown red scabs. These clinical signs are most likely caused by insufficient content of the following. Insufficient content of the following. So basically, some studies have linked. The initial onset, so this is actually what we call the angular chelitis, angular chelitis. And studies have linked this angular chelitis with a nutritional deficiency, especially vitamin B12. Sorry, vitamin B2, B2, not B12, vitamin B2. That is what riboflavin, riboflavin. And even iron. So is connected with iron and vitamin B2 or riboflavin, riboflavin. So these, when they are uh, not taken in sufficient amount or when people are malnourished because of riboflavin and iron, it can lead to angular chelitis, angular 
cheilitis. And that's over here. We will be looking at what? Riboflavin. Riboflavin. So we can give a supplement, perhaps, that contains this vitamin to help the person. So your answer here will be B. Answer here will be B. Children from a certain township present with a brittle teeth, uh, malocclusion, dental enamel erosion, dental pigmentation that looks like yellow brown spots. What is the likely cause of this presentation? Why do you think you brush your teeth? That's a question. Why do you think you brush your teeth? You brush your teeth because your teeth contain the right amount of what to call it, fluorine or fluorine. Fluorine, fluorine. So now, if you're having too much of it, it leads to these conditions. It leads to these conditions. It leads to discoloration of the teeth. And this is called fluorosis, 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 fluorosis. So it can lead to a stained brown teeth, stained brown teeth. So that's because of too much of what? Fluorine, fluorine, too much of fluorine in the water. So over here, we could be looking at high levels, high levels of this fluorine. So the answer is D. All right. It's an eight-day-old boy was delivered to the hospital on the second day after the onset of the disease. His parents complained of his fuzziness, regurgitation, body temperature up to 38.5, red skin with infiltration in the lumbar area. Red skin with infiltration in the lumbar area. Okay. His medical history has no peculiarities. It has no peculiarities. The child is in a severe condition, inert pill, circles poorly in the lumbar area on the sacrum and in the bottles. There is a tense infiltration, infiltration with hyperemic and cyanotic areas and with a soft spot, 8 by 7 centimeters in each center. Guys, definitely you are looking out for what? For infiltrative sort of a disease, isn't it? which in this case, you could be looking out for it, for an abscess kind of a, uh, infection, isn't it? But of course, we say uh, we can liken abscess to what we call it, the phlegmond, to phlegmond, 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 phlegmond. Now, abscess will be more of the fluid, uh -huh, more of what the fluid trying to, uh, to spread and things like that. So the phlegmond also... One word that also deals with what an inflammation, uh, inflammation that is spreading or about to spread, about to spread, about to spread. All right. Now the stool is ten times in twenty-four hours with green and mucous admixtures. What is the most likely diagnosis? So again, over here we could be looking at what a phlegmon of the newborn, phlegmon of the newborn, which describes an inflammation of the soft tissue that spreads under the skin or inside the body, inside the body. So it normally ends up producing what we call what? A pass. Producing what? A pass. Producing a pass. So basically, these are what it is, or this is what it is. So over here, we are looking at a phlegmond of the newborn, and that is why your answer will be D, a phlegmond, a phlegmond. All right. A 72 year old man with a pneumonia complains of a marked dyspnea. So, the person has what? Pneumonia. Now, there's marked dyspnea, chest pain, severe cough with expectoration, 39.5 to 40 degrees Celsius. That is high. No urination for a whole day. That is not good. Objectively, the patient is conscious. Respiratory rate is 36. That is high. Over the right lower pulmonary loop, percussion sound is dull. On its quotation, there is bronchial respiration and numerous moist crackles. Blood pressure is 80, 60. Heart rate is 120. Sounds, heart sounds are muffled, tachycardia. Guys, this, of course, there's a complication of this pneumonia, which need to be looked at critically. And so, therefore, 
we have to hospitalize this person into the intensive care unit intensive care unit intensive care unit all right so over here plural effusion empyema pleurisy and even kidney, kidney failure are coming into play so we have to treat this person critically like take it walk up otherwise this person could just go all right now just before i think it's the same question oh so just before i continue don't forget to practice these questions practice these questions on our website practice them medent web.com medentweb.com do practice them get to know your strength if you can really remember it and after that there will be a precock or a mock for you that one is timed you'll be bound by a time which also help you to build on your timing all right so please do well to have access to all of these things all right so over here i think the same thing your answer is e all 